Um, and I don't think I need to introduce my next guest, Dame Monica Mason. Uh, I'm sure everyone in this room is all too aware of her glorious career um, and her as association with, with Helpman. When did that begin? When were you first aware of him? I think really very close to the beginning of starting the Royal Ballet. I was a teenager. I would have been about 17, I suppose, when I first saw uh, Bobby and Fred rehearsing Ugly Sisters for Cinderella. And, uh, but, but even earlier than uh, that, actually in a rehearsal, one was aware of, of Bobby. First of all, he was known as Bobby which uh, sort of astonished me. I mean, by everybody? Uh, yes, by, by absolutely everybody. everybody. Does, and yeah. uh, I think that was, that amazed me when I first joined the company, that, you know, Fred was called Fred, and um, oh, Sir Fred, and Bobby was Bobby, M Margot was Margot, but Madam was Madam. Madam. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, rem I remember very clearly, uh, uh, of course, Madam being in a rehearsal room. I don't remember what it was, but Madame was taking a rehearsal, and uh, the atmosphere was very tense, as it always was when she was around, and she was always uh, impatient and slightly on edge, and because she was always in such a hurry. And uh, Bobby came in and knelt by the side of her chair and whispered something in her ear, whereupon she absolutely <laughs> burst out laughing. And I remember thinking, how amazing what could he possibly have said <laughs> to make her laugh like that? And, of course, one saw it repeated um, frequently because she adored him and he was often around. And you could sense the slight rivalry, I think, between Bobby and Fred, slight probably, to say least, mm. uh, when they were rehearsing uh, Ugly Sisters. And, of course, they also never gave anything away um, to each other that uh, if Bobby had got a new idea for a moment, he certainly wasn't going to show Fred what it was in the rehearsal studio. <laughs> so when the performances came, of course, uh, it was constant um, improvisation, really, I think, on their part. And uh, they were absolutely wicked. And we all used to just stand in the wings, crowded in the wings, because, of course, that first opening scene of Cinderella is almost impossible to see from the wings because of the, the nature of the room. But somehow, you know, we used to be on top of one another to watch them. And, I mean, they were both absolutely outrageous. I never saw Bobby do Carabos. I saw Fred do Carabos. But, but Bobby was just the most um, wonderful, for me, the most wonderful, warm... Um, can't, I found him incredibly kind because he was so conscious when people were totally green mm. and he just took such a delight in teaching you something and he, he'd take you to the side of the studio and just uh, remind you in the, that when you were going to be wearing a heel um, as a court lady how differently that would make you walk and how differently you needed to feel about yourself. He couldn't help but keep I informing you in the most generous way. I was very struck in the South Bank film, actually, that obviously he was very, very good with children. You felt he was one of those people who had a magic touch with children. Well, you know, he, yeah. he was so charismatic and so irresistible that it was like a moth to a flame. Mm. You First of all, you recognised... I mean, you know, I'd come from... <laughs> I always say this, I'd come from Johannesburg, which has so little theatre available um, in the 50s, and I, I landed here in London, and, you know, to find myself in a, in a room where there was Ashton and de Valois and Margot and Bobby all in a room together, having only ever seen their photographs mm. in those wonderful Baron of the Ballet books, and, and having read about the Sabberswell's Ballet, and then there were all these people... But what was so wonderful about Bobby was that he was never intimidating. He, he was so welcoming and warm that you couldn't wait to ask him a question, and he would always take time to answer you. 
Uh, you are far too young ever to have seen him as a danseur noble, but yes. probably you saw him in red shoes when you were young. No, but I didn't actually. Didn't no, no, I never saw the film. I was going to ask you whether you agreed with um, uh, Beryl Gray's assessment of him as a dancer. I, I whether you had any no. sense of what his technical strengths and shortcomings were. By the time I knew him and saw him as an ugly sister... I could never really believe he'd been the dancer that mm. people spoke about. <laughs> because by then, of course, it was 20 years on. Um, and by this time, he was acting a lot. Uh, what amazed me was that this was somebody who seemed to f fly around between the theatre and ballet and travel the world. And One of my f last memories of him was actually when I was in Australia, uh, when I was... Um, interested in, well I was headhunted, and like Mayna was, uh, for the job of the Australian, the director of the Australian Ballet, and Mayna and I were there, and um, together, we had known each other because we danced together, um, and uh, really I think the final choice was down to Mayna or me, mm. I say this, yeah, um, <laughs> and I decided in the end not to go for it, I wanted to come back to the Royal Ballet, and but I bumped into Bobby, and I was just leaving the Opera House, Sydney Opera House, as he was going in one day. And, of course, th th he was so um, warm, and I gave him, I remember giving him such a hug, I almost felt I gave him too much of a hug, because I could feel him slightly <laughs> think, oh my God, this woman's going to break me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was because I hadn't seen him in years, and... He so belonged in that place, and yet, of course, I'd known him in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, I just want to wish you good luck with whatever your decision is. And, and I think that was That's the last the time I spoke to him. Yes. But, of course, you worked quite closely with him on the creation of Electra, didn't you, in 1963? Yes. You played Clytemnestra, yes, yes. Marina was Electra. Yes. Um, what was he like in the rehearsal room? Was he one of those choreographers who knew exactly what he wanted, or was there room for you to contribute? Oh, no, he, he very much worked on you. And, and of course, I, um, he had described the set uh, very much before we saw it on the stage, and he'd explained that there was a, a long flight of stairs and that there was a platform at the back and that I would be with Derek Rencher uh, um, sort of entwined. He said, I, I, I want you to think of yourself as two snakes uh, and I'm going to tie you into knots. And, um, and he did, and, uh, <laughs> but it was all very erotic too. And sort of, I think I was probably, I don't know, 1963, I was... I had turned 21, but um, I was very virginal still. <laughs> and uh, he said to me, Monica, you look a little confused from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, oh, I, I, ho I, didn't, I hope that wasn't showing. And he said, um, never mind about understanding it. He said, just do as I say. And he said, when you're in that costume and when you, you know, in the performance, you'll be fine. Is your mother coming? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, she comes to see everything, but you don't have to worry, she just understands. <laughs> so he, you know, he, he always had such humour, but he was so generous. And <coughs> years later, I remember we were performing in New York at the New Met, and uh, he was sitting in the audience for a stage rehearsal, and uh, this would probably be in the 70s, and I went up front, and... He was, at that time, I think, producing something on Broadway. And he was looking his usual elegant self. And um, the thing I always remember, he would cross his legs. He had very, very pretty ankles. And he always wore black silk socks. And I always used to look down. And, and I remember even there in the sort of semi-darkness, I looked down and he still had his silk socks on. Mm. But I actually said to him you know, how lovely it was to see him. And he said, well, I... I couldn't not come in and see the company while you're here in New York and how lovely to see you and how are you and I said oh I'm very well and you know I miss you because you m have meant so much to me and I said I've always wanted to ask you this question I'm so pleased I got the chance now how is it that you did so much and he said I never said no 
<laughs> Whenever somebody asked me to do something, I always said yes. He said, I think it's quite a good lesson in life. Yes, isn't it? Yes. Um, and a lecture, of course, I think was one of those ballets which audiences loved and critics hated. Yes. And it sort of died to death, but was it any good? Tell, yeah, of course, I never was in it. I mean, I'm, of course, I was in it. I never saw yes. it. Um, it Did was it feel good? It felt very sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I think it felt, you know, it was a. It was a wonderful experience because it was working with Bobby and working with Bobby from square one so that he, you watched him create this whole ballet. Uh, he was absolutely thrilled with the music that uh, Malcolm Arnold had written. And uh, as I mentioned to you the other day, I was in Northampton last mm. weekend mm. because there was a festival for Malcolm Arnold, the, the, the eighth time they've done a festival since he died. And I had been invited to come and open the festival. And uh, I was really felt very honoured uh, to be there. And because although I felt I, I didn't know Malcolm Arnold, I knew he was around, and I knew he was around for Electra, but I don't remember um, ever having a conversation with him. I might have met him, been introduced. But um, everybody who worked with Malcolm Arnold loved the fact that he was so amenable and that because he worked a lot in film, he was also able to adapt music very easily. And so both Bobby and Fred always, and Kenneth in fact too, spoke about Malcolm Arnold as being somebody who was so, um, uh, so easily adapted their score. You know, Malcolm, can you please get rid of those last eight bars? I can't use that. And he just took the scissors and chopped it, went to the piano. He did uh, homage to the... And he did homage to the Queen yeah. for Fred, and it was yeah. exactly the same when he did mm. that. Mm. And, uh, and of course, he'd done the English dances for Solitaire for Kenneth, and he also did Sweeney Todd for mm. Cranko. And, and, and Malcolm was this very, very amenable madcap uh, who would chop music off and add a few <laughs> bars if that was what was required. And so this was, a, again for Bobby, a very happy collaboration. The set for Electra was shocking because Arthur Boyd, an Australian uh, painter uh, and designer, had again drawn some very, very rude things on, on the wings. And I, I remember coming on stage for the very first time and seeing the set. And Bobby said to me, have you looked at the wing upstage there? I said, yes, I have. He said, it's wonderful, isn't it? It's so <laughs> rude. What will Ninette say when she says <laughs> um, was it? Was it similar to Hamlet? Was it very compressed and intense? And it was very intense, in, in, like Hamlet in the sense that it was, a, again, a very condensed yes. version of the 20 story. 20 minutes or something. Yes, yes. yes. And, and, of course, Nadia Narina was absolutely fearless, had this... Wonderful. I don't quite know why Electra needed to be thrown from one side of the stage <laughs> to the other and from upstage to downstage. So much so that I do remember in, in the audience in America on a performance uh, of somebody, a woman, out front who, who let out the most incredible scream and then we heard this enormous bump as she passed out and they had to come <laughs> and carry her up because the, they couldn't get anybody to understudy Nadia because she was fearless mm. and and Annette Page was asked to be the cover. And Annette said, I'm not going to be thrown yeah. around like that. So there never was an understudy. Yeah. And thankfully, Nadia was never off. Yes. <laughs> but it was, a, you know, you, you felt from Bobby. I mean, there was one wonderful moment where Clytemnestra had to enter from downstage, stage left, uh, with this, I, I put on this cloak. And then when I reached center, I had to spread the cloak so that it actually was its full size and then he wanted me to crawl up the stairs like a snake uh, with this cloak spread out behind me well when I saw the size of the cloak I thought how am I ever going to manage that so of course I, I the first time I did it I came on from the side and I reached the centre and I turned round and I raised it and it went plop in a great lump and Bobby said oh I think we need to try that again so we did it a couple of times and I said show me how to do this and he said well so he took it off and tied it around his neck and then he came on and he turned around and he did something 
completely magical and the thing rose and it <laughs> fell completely perfectly. Now, I don't think I ever achieved it, but he just did it once and, and there was this little smile and I said, trust you. <laughs> he said, I've done a few cloaks in my time. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Monica, thank you so much. Thank you.